I've often shared with you that music can soften our heart and prepare us to worship. And indeed, uh, this day that has occurred from Dennis's singing of uh, How Great Thou Art to the ladies uh, singing Gentle Shepherd, lead us, help us find our way to Jackie's playing some of the songs you may have picked up on. One was Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And then um, Dennis sang, um, he laid down his life for me. Isn't that love? And this day we are encompassed as always by that great power, that great love. And so as we share together today, uh, I'm going to share something that he always tells us to share in scripture. I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, repentance. The scripture I'm gonna read uh, may seem a little difficult for us to hear, but I think uh, it's good for us to examine ourselves from time to time and try and root out from our lives those things that cause the people of the world to find us no different than they. And as I share today, remember I'm looking in a mirror. And if it fits you, fine, if not, it certainly fits me. From Book of Alma, chapter 3, 47, through the first verse that uh, Jim read in the call to worship, 57. I'm going to start, I'm sorry, at 46. And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if you have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can ye feel so now? Could ye say if ye were called to die at this time within yourselves, that ye have been sufficiently humble, that your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ who will come to redeem his people from their sins. Behold, are ye stripped of pride? I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. And this life is a life of preparation to meet him. Behold, ye must prepare quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such an one hath not eternal life. Behold, I say, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? I say unto you that such a one is not prepared, and I would that he should prepare quickly for the hour is close at hand, and he knoweth not when the time shall come. For such a one is not found guiltless. And again I say unto you, is there one among you that doth mock, make a mock of his brother, or that heapeth upon him persecutions? Woe unto such a one, for he is not prepared. And the time is at hand that he must repent, or he cannot be saved. Yea, even woe unto all ye workers of iniquity, repent, repent, for the Lord God hath spoken it. Behold, he sendeth an invitation 
to all men. For his arms of mercy are extended towards them. And he saith, repent. And I will receive you. Might our understanding of this process of repentance become a little clearer to us today as we continue our fabulous adventure in trusting him. Indeed, surely the presence of the Lord is always in this place. And it is up to us to invite that holy presence into our lives every day. And to so prepare our lives that our life would be a place where that spirit can dwell. Not for our glory, but for his. It's been a special morning already. Many wonderful words have been sung and shared. If you have nothing to do on the weekend, go to Pleasant Hill and Big Creek and, and hear Dennis and Larry. It's a uh, special for me this day as well, because uh, up here with uh, my grandson, I think it's his first opportunity to give some public ministry outside of giving a prayer or a testimony and prayer service. I'm thankful for my brothers behind me as they have made preparation also to share. We know that Jesus began his public ministry as it says in Mark 4 and 16. And it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we know that repentance is one of the fundamental doctrines of the church. And so I'd like to share with you, as I've already said a little bit on this topic this morning, and my message to you is an invitation an invitation for each of us to see ourselves as God sees us, to an invitation to yield our hearts to him, an invitation to give to him, not our leftovers, but our first fruits, our whole soul response and an invitation from him to align our lives with his will, to change our lives, to repent. We can ask ourselves, and I ask myself, Am I following my own course, my own agenda? Am I striving to please myself? Or do I desire to please God? Am I attempting to satisfy the appetites of the natural man or the natural woman, or am I striving to please God? Our Father in heaven can help us answer these questions. He can also help us in our quest to improve and become more like his son, Jesus. I know, 
I know that as we submit and yield our hearts to God, he will bless us. Jesus sets the perfect example for us. His only desire is to fulfill God's plan. God's will is his will. God's work is his work. Even when faced with making the ultimate sacrifice for us, Jesus submitted his will to his Father when he said, Not my will, but thine be done. Can we say that? We must, every one of us, frankly, face the fact that we are not only imperfect creatures who need constant improvement, but that in our own strength, we cannot make the improvement necessary to fit ourselves to God's kingdom. The natural man, the natural woman, is not simply an imperfect person who will someday perfect him or herself. The scriptures tell us that the natural person, the natural man, is an enemy to God. He is in rebellion against God. The natural man or woman is living Apart from God, he or she does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They don't accept his love, his word, his forgiveness. And the beginning of improvement is the laying down of our arms and a, and a surrender to God in humble repentance. Repentance is more than just merely admitting that some of the things we do are unwise or foolish. It is more than merely quitting doing those unwise or foolish things and then sitting on the sidelines, doing nothing, remaining neutral. A person who is in rebellion against God has not made himself right with God when he lays down his weapons and quits fighting against God. We are not the person we ought to be until we have enlisted ourselves on God's side and turned our lives to support the cause of right. Repentance is a change of mind which results in a change of action. Repentance is a process of leaving our past and returning to he who has created us. It is a change of mind from an embrace of sin to rejection of sin and from a rejection of Jesus to an embrace of Jesus and to have an ever-growing, deepening faith in Jesus. The Apostle Paul 
in making his defense before King Agrippa, and I would suggest this afternoon or sometime this week you read the 25th and 6th chapter of the book of Acts. And as Paul stood in front of King Agrippa in the 26th chapter of Acts, the 19th and 20th verse, he told of the wonder in this chapter of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and what it came to mean to him because of his vision that he had on the way to Damascus. He then continues in 26, 19, and 20, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And so this process of repentance is turning and re readjusting our focus unto he who is. Self-satisfied, uh, neutral people with no particular faults or sins or, or habits need to repent too. They have not, we have not truly repented until we choose to enlist on God's side in the battle between good and evil. There are no neutrals in the battle between good and evil. And we see evil in our world, in our land, in the decisions that are made by various people who have political power. You cannot stand on the sidelines. You must actively enlist on one side or the other. Alma says it quite well, back in the third chapter again, verses 67 and 68. For I say unto you, that whatever is good cometh from God, and whatever is evil cometh from the devil. Therefore, if a man bringeth forth good works, he hearkeneth unto the voice of the good shepherd, and he doth follow him. Verse 69, but whosoever bringeth forth evil works, the same becometh a child of the devil, for he hearkeneth unto his voice and doth follow him. Let us always choose good. Repentance is more than sorrow for being caught in sin. It is more than sorrow for having committed sin. That is what's known as worldly sorrow. But God wants us to engage in godly sorrow. It's the kind of sorrow which demands humility, restitution, and the seeking of forgiveness and a changed life. We're very familiar with the story found in Luke 9 and verses, Luke 19 verses 1 through 10, this story of Zacchaeus. And I won't read it all, but in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by unjust means, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, 
For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Have we not been lost at times in our lives? Have we not walked off that straight and narrow path? And how often have we come before the Lord and asked him for forgiveness? Sometimes for the same sin that we commit over and over. And always his arms of mercy are extended towards us. And he says, I forgive you. And I'm here to help you straighten out that course of your life. Sorrow at being caught leads to no repentance, no change, no growth, no progress, no change of allegiance or loyalty. And the end of that course, as it says in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. For godly sorrow, godly sorrow, worketh repentance till to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So where is, what kind of sorrow do you have for the things that you have done? Godly sorrow sometimes is translated as godly grief. This is an acute sense of sadness we experience as a result of the sins we have committed. Godly, godly sorrow results from a heartfelt conviction that we have offended God by our sin. Such a burning conviction produces in our hearts a godly sorrow. And as we look upon him who was pierced for our sins, we are deeply grieved in spirit. And we resolve hopefully within our hearts that we will with the help of God, as it says in Isaiah 1, 16, cease to do evil and learn to do well. And it isn't something that we wake up tomorrow morning or this afternoon and say, hey, I've got it made. I'm only going to do well from now on. We need to keep out of our life whatever keeps Christ out of our mind. And this is a daily battle. There isn't a one of us who isn't exempt from that. If you are, you'll soon be translated. So beam, beam you up, Scotty. Repentance involves a change in our thinking and doing, rising out of a change in the center of our affections. Whereas we previously have loved self and the things that minister to our selfish will, we now love God and the things of his kingdom and are eager to work in such fashion as to express that love by what we do and say. And so to repent means to change one's mind, to change our purpose, to try really hard every day 
to do what he's called us to do and to live the life that he showed us how to live. Repent is used in the, in the scriptures to describe the beginning of a genuine spiritual change. It always involves a change for the better as a person turns away from sin while turning towards God. Repentance is ceasing to think as we have thought and thinking again in the way that God thinks. Repentance is not a single act, a single event, or a single experience. It is a lifetime process. And it's a process where we acknowledge, yeah, I've really messed up, but we do not beat ourselves over that which we have done that was not right. We don't repent of everything today and waken tomorrow morning to find our repentance is complete and that we are new creatures. We may be new in that our allegiance has shifted to God and that the direction of our life is in the process of changing. But no matter how long you have traveled on the wrong road, you can always turn around. By reversing direction, when we first discover that we are on the wrong road, does not bring us immediately to our destination. We must slowly and painfully retrace our steps by the way we have come until we, have, until we find the right road. Most of us probably, before GPS and maybe even with GPS, have been taken a wrong road. And when we come to our senses, we backtrack until we find the right road to our destination. And once we do that, once we find the right road, we are not to sit down on the road, for the roads are to be traveled on. And God wants us to thrust in our sickle with all our might and to prepare for the days that are yet before us. And some of those days we have read will not be easy, but in all things, he is trustworthy and we can trust in him no matter what. And when those difficult times come in your life, remember, as you've heard me say sometimes in the past, nowhere do I find in the scripture it says, and it came to stay. It always says, and it came to pass. And so as we trust in him, no matter what difficulties we're facing in life, these too shall pass if we trust in him, no matter what. True repentance occurs deep within our hearts and results in a visible difference in our actions. Repentance is not just words, but actions. L. Wayne Updike, former president of 70 in the church years ago, wrote a book on repentance, and he says repentance is a conscious, positive 
response to an ever-increasing revelation of God. And that's what's to happen in our life, an ever-increasing understanding and devotion to he who fearfully and wonderfully created each one of us. You, I, we all are of infinite worth to him, no matter what our path or choices have been in the past. For God wants to be involved in all of our life. He wants repentance to be a daily part of our thought processes. He wants us to take seriously our daily walk with him and, and the witness of himself that he desires to give to us through his Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought how difficult it is to persuade, to persuade people to take life seriously? How many people do you know? And maybe in your own life, there have been times when you would have rather ate and slept and be merry and find some pleasant experiences in life it is in partial recognition of this difficulty that others, and maybe we ourselves, have had that the Lord has provided that we who love him should come together as we have today from time to time to worship him and to have the basic course of our life rightly directed to think again what path, what road, what is my response to him? But of course, this is not easy. Many times we choose to take parts of our lives seriously. And so we may choose to give our attention, more of our attention to our business affairs. Others of us are probably greatly concerned about our hobbies and spend hour after hour perfecting uh, our golf stroke. It's never been my problem. I could never see chasing a little white ball around a cow pasture, losing my religion. Or many of us sometimes spend our time at the computer or now that little iPhone thing or pad, or whatever you call those gadgets where you communicate. Um, in my day, we didn't have those things. We had phones that you dial. Some of you have no idea what in the world that is. And so on these devices, we chat and we play games. Or we spend hours working on shining our cars or learning how to make trout flies and how to cast. Hear me clearly, I'm not saying any of these activities are bad. We can and do become very serious about aspects of our lives. But repentance is not confined to one small area of our life. It involves the entirety of our life, the whole person. Repentance involves not only my acts, but my thoughts, my purposes, my methods, my, my attitudes, my emotions, and my allegiances. It is not the outward incidentals of my life that needs to be changed, but what needs to be changed is I, the whole person. No part of life can be rightly directed except as, as the whole of life is pointed in the right way. And so the question I would ask of myself and the question I would ask of each of you 
is, are you, am I, placing too great of an importance on some lesser concern of life which runs counter to the purpose of creation. I would suggest that every one of us needs to be concerned with the totality, with the total life of victory which Jesus Christ made possible for us. And I think it's important to remember always that this Jesus lived among us, lived among men, and he suffered among men, and he knew the pain of betrayal, the rejection of his friends, the slap on the face, a kiss, that really didn't mean what a kiss ought to mean, who found that when the going got toughest, those who should have followed him turned his back, turned their backs and followed him no more. Let that not be us. He willingly went to the cross for us. He suffered beyond our understanding so that you and I can have all our sins washed away and we no longer need to drag them behind us like a ball on a chain. No matter how far we might have strayed, no matter what we did during our time, our period of rebellion, Jesus' sacrifice frees us from our past. Do you believe that? Have you cut that ball and chain as you've asked him to forgive you for whatever it is you have done? And if you have, who are you to say, bad me, I can Praise me, the Lord loves me enough to walk with me and to push those aside. When we accept God's grace and forgiveness, we are freed from our past. Yes, we are flawed, but we are tremendously loved and forgiven. We have no reason, no reason to be ashamed or to let our past keep us from serving him. In Paul's writing to the saints at Corinth, he said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, my scriptures are so thin that my markers slide away from me. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He said, first of all, it is not there by accident. Paul was dealing with a matter of basic importance for his time and for our time in all ages and among all people, sin, sin saps life. There is no true life except as we win the victory over sin. Because of this, because this is so, those who would be Kingdom builders should be the last people in the world to treat sin lightly. So, I am reminded of um, 
Apostle Donald Old Chessworth. He was speaking in the uh, here's my brain fog, Stone Church. And for those of you that attended there, you know the upper deck, the congregation it has seats that come around. And Apostle Chessworth, he always had all of his sermons typed out completely. And he would go through them, and as he would turn the pages, and he realized he was near, near, nearly out of time, he would slip through four or five. And one day, uh, after he ran out of time and finished his sermon, and as he was greeting the people who came by, one lady came up to him and said, Brother, Brother Chessworth, I want to know what was on pages 12 through 16. I don't have 16 pages, but I'm going to jump way ahead. And so this morning, will you consider, seriously consider, welcoming him into every aspect of your life? Would you consider making preparations this week to really ponder your walk with God? Ask him to show you the areas in your life where you have put self ahead of him. Ask him in your prayer life, show me those sins that I have yet to acknowledge so I can get rid of them. And before you come to the sacrament table next Sunday, ask him for help in setting a better course in your life. Think about this process of repentance where you will determine in your life to reject the wrong and return to the right. Ask for his forgiveness and ask him to help you make the changes in your life that would be more Christ-like. Repentance always involves a change for the better as a person turns away from sin while turning toward God. As a wonderful 70 in the church used to say, and you've heard Sugar and Lynn and myself and maybe others say this, keep your repentance fresh. Many of us are procrastinators. Do not put off your repentance. Think, do not put off your repentance thinking, I'll get around to it at 11 o'clock. What if he comes at 10.30? Remember, Christ's cleansing power can remove the deepest stain of sin. God graciously forgives all who confess their sins to him. And because of this Jesus, Sinners can be forgiven, and we can stand before a holy God because we are worthy. Yes, our actions have not been, but if we come unto him and ask him for forgiveness, he's placed a spark of divinity within each one of us, and we are forgiven and we are worthy. And so we can stand, as I said before, a holy God. And the question is, how do you want to stand? How do you stand now? And how do you want to stand? Where do you want to be standing tomorrow? And in closing, section 38. The Lord is speaking to us even today through this, all of two. But behold, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, my eyes are upon you, and I am in your midst, and you cannot see me. But the day soon cometh that ye shall see me and know that I am, for the veil of darkness will soon be rent, and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Wherefore, gird up your loins and be prepared. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and the enemy shall not overcome. If you keep, as we sang in the family worship, and as Jackie also has played, if you will keep your eyes upon Jesus and try always to remember those arms of mercy are extended towards you and he says, repent. Let the Lord know you want him involved in every part of your life.